test audio uh hello scanner danner here <laughs> it sounded pretty weak all right guys so we're back on this uh chevy express van and uh we have the advantage today of having talked to the customer so um, i called my friend last night and i got some info on this problem and um to keep this quick the main detail that i got from him is well first of all this has been about a two-year um, battle and the first thing that was changed with this problem with this exact situation of it going into a, a limp mode was the throttle body connector the, the connector itself was changed and he said that after the connector was changed it was good for a while and then the problem started again. You want me to stand here and hold an umbrella over your head like those guys <laughs> did for Obama that one day the two military guys were standing there getting soaking wet? I didn't see that. Oh, it was terrible. <laughs> if I was Obama, I would have grabbed the umbrella and held it over the military guy. Yeah, right? Yeah, it is raining, but where's my umbrella then, Danner? Uh, but the key piece of information for me was that he told me after the wiring was fixed that it was good for a while, and I didn't get a... I didn't, he didn't tell me for how long, but I kind of jumped on that. I, I believe that the wire we saw that fell out pretty much, it didn't fall out, I mean, but I barely was tugging on it. In fact, I wasn't tugging on it. I was just trying to take the tape off. Uh, I believe that that is our problem. And he had said that the throttle body was changed after the wiring. So it was wiring first, it was good for a while, then started doing it again, then they changed the throttle body, and then this has been an ongoing thing for... I'm not sure how long, but um, <clears throat> that's cool. The voice in the background is Elijah, my nephew. We can get a shot of Elijah again, or we get him on camera yesterday. We're getting Danner right now with the umbrella. <laughs> what is that? What happened to your umbrella? What kind of umbrella is that? It's a flower. It's a flower. What are you doing? I don't need an umbrella. I don't need an umbrella. What the heck, man? <laughs> what did you do? I'm gonna break it trying to like get it back to the way it went. <laughs> I don't need an umbrella. Come on. Come on, this guy. <laughs> what are we doing here? Well, look, I can just leave it sit right here. True. And but look at the have... sky. Nothing's organized. These are, just, these are just sprinkles, man. Yeah. Okay, uh, any, any, anyway, no, this, I'm, what we're going to do is I'm going to repair this properly, redo all the wiring. We're going to put it back together. We're going to take a, a quick test drive a couple times around the industrial park here, and then um, we're going to give it back to him. And my brother is going to do the oxygen sensor, the heater circuit for him. Um, he's going to replace the sensor and, uh, and give it back. Um, the, to be clear, the O2 had nothing to do with his main complaint, which is the reduced power mode from the throttle body. And um, yeah, man, we're just going to go from there. I'll, I mean, I'll keep you guys updated. I told my friend Mike that if this comes back and happens again, to please bring it back to us and we'll, we'll take it up again. Uh, the hardest part sometimes with garages and technicians is when you have a job like this and you never hear from the customer again, you never know if it was fixed. Fortunately for me, I play hockey with this guy, so I see him at least once a week, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll get the update. So anyway, we're going to repair this connector and go for a test drive. That should never really pull apart like that. Using my new snap-on crimpers. Unfortunately, I should be using the red ones, and the only thing that was available to me today was the blue ones but these will work got these from napa the blue ones are a little bit fatter for heavier gauge wiring but we should be okay i have those solder sleeves too but i'm not a big fan of those to be honest with you i would rather crimp and heat shrink the solder sleeves are like a low a low melting point solder so I don't know. Could have used those. Looks like that's gonna work just fine. Let that cool off for a second. 
Okay, good. It does have the epoxy that comes out. It's like a glue, a sealant, and I like that. We'll be good. Oh, I got some info too on who did the wiring. The uh, house wiring that was done that we were making fun of, my friend Mike did that, but it was just for his brake controller. So that blue wire that we um, got a shot of, Caleb, and we, you know, the stuff up front, the wire nuts and everything, that was all for his trailer brake wiring that he added. So just an aftermarket add-on stuff. I have no problem with what he did. We, has nothing to do with this. And um, I did also find out that he did not do this wiring. And so we can feel free to make fun of some random person that we don't know who did this wiring repair. <laughs> I just wanted to be careful. Didn't want to throw my friend under the bus too much. I have exactly two of the red ones left. So we're going to use them for this one. What is that? No, this is called Tessa tape, and uh, Why do you have it's like a real high fiber tape. Whose is this? That's a flashlight and a knife. I got a new um, wallet. Oh, yeah? Uh-huh. I, I got one of those chains, one that you like. Nice. Huh? I had one of those. I, I have a Dave & Buster card, um, a McDonald's card, a Wendy, like an ice cream place card. I mean, uh, yeah, Dairy Queen card. Um, I'm going to fish this back up front. You probably can see where I'm at, Caleb, from here. How do, you feel about How do I feel right now? <laughs> it's a good thing the camera was off. You know, we had Mike talking to you, owner of this car, my friend. We had more than an hour just getting this stupid doghouse on and off. I changed my mind. I don't want this back. If it happens again, take it somewhere else. <laughs> just, just kidding, Mike. Sort of. Codes menu, display, all powertrain codes. All right, so just O2 heater codes, bank one, sensor two. Those are not going to go away. What I want to show you guys before we take this for a test drive is our oxygen sensor heater test you can do looking at scan data when the engine's cold. So I only started this very briefly uh, just to move it forward. And it's been sitting for a while, putting the doghouse back on. So we should be good to show you this test. Do, you need the oxygen sensors to be cold for this test. And this is just all four oxygen sensors we're gonna look at. What we're looking at right now is 450 millivolts roughly on all four sensors, right? And that voltage is actually coming from the computer. It's known as a bias voltage. Uh, when the sensors are cold, they're uh, essentially an open circuit. So we're sending out this 450 millivolts down to the sensor and there's no path for it. There's no path to ground. It's a very, very weak signal. And uh, with no path to ground, it maintains it at 450. If I put my finger, this is how weak this signal is. If I put my finger on the O2 signal wire on any one of these four, Does it pull it? it'll pull it and, and touch my body to ground, it'd pull it straight to ground. So when the sensor is cold, it's infinite in resistance. And when the sensor starts to heat up, it starts to lower its resistance, which bleeds off the bias voltage. So what we should see on all four channels, if the heaters are working, is that 450 millivolt bias will start to drop off almost immediately, telling us the heaters are working, the sensor's warming up. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, as far as the spikes go on the screen right now, I should have mentioned that beforehand. A lot of you are stuck on that right now. Don't be. Look at the min-max scales, 443, 460. Very, very tight window. Uh, I'm just reading, reading some min-max on one of them. So uh, when I start this, though, we want to see these lines drop. And what you're going to see because we already know the heater's bad on the bank two sensor one, which is the top left of my screen. That one is not gonna drop the same way as the other three. I'm okay if they climb as well. You see the bank one sensor one actually is climbing. That's, that's okay too. The two downstreams actually look like the heaters have not turned on yet. And that can be a factor too. Sometimes we delay the turn on of the downstreams, but you see them reacting. See the bank two sensor two dropping. The bank one sensor one's actually climbing. 
That's a non-issue. Whether they drop or climb, the fact that they're doing that quickly is telling you the heaters are working. What do you notice about the bank two? Sensor one, it's still stuck at the same 450 millivolt range, okay? Um, the answer to why the upstream bank one sensor one climbed instead of dropped is it actually um, was heating up at a point where it, it was starting to produce a signal and so it kind of overrode that bias voltage bleed off that I had mentioned. Mm. Uh, I hope that makes sense. That sensor actually became active in that area where my little cursor is instead of dropping off first. And, uh, but th those are working heaters on all three of those. You can see on the bank two sensor one, that is a not, not a working heater circuit. And then one of the things you can do again with heaters is raise the RPM, use the exhaust to heat it up and then see if the sensor actually functions. And let's watch the bank two sensor one. You see exhaust gas is heating that sensor up now with the higher RPM. I know you guys can't hear that, but yeah, I'm about 2000 RPM now. And now that, that sensor just became active and went into closed loop on that bank two from exhaust gas. So that's a working sensor, but the heater itself has malfunctioned in that sensor. Just quick test you can do with the scan tool, guys. That's all. Just wanted to show that. And uh, at this point, what I want to do is pull up my throttle actuator control data. And uh, just in case we make this thing do it on this test drive. Wait, let me read the codes again real quick because my check engine light just came back on. Yeah, just O2 heater codes. All right, no problem there. Um, remind me, Caleb, we didn't tell Danner about the leaking exhaust manifolds. Okay. Um, th that's important because we're about to replace an oxygen sensor for a failed heater circuit, and we have leaking manifolds, which can mess up fuel trim data and give you oxygen sensor related fault codes from exhaust leaks. So he, it, the owner needs to be aware of that. TPS one, TPS two, we can watch those. And uh, let's go for a test drive. Doing? What are you doing? I was gonna yank that hair out of your nose. I well, <laughs> you just told me I had a hair hanging out of my nose. Instead of being I was gonna I was gonna yeah I was gonna yank it. Now I'm self-conscious. <laughs> I could all, I could just see it from the side. It was waving at me. It was not asking you to pluck it though. <laughs> so my friend Mike said when he drove this that it was uh, about an eight mile drive to my brother's shop and it did it twice on the way. And then he got it here and he said he drove it for like 45 minutes around the industrial park trying to get it to act up again and he couldn't. That's so, true. yeah, I mean, I'm hoping we fixed it. Intermittent uh, problems are definitely the hardest. Just some takeaways when you have intermittent problems, a good visual inspection, look for areas of heat and vibration that's the key and by that i mean look look at your wiring harnesses where there is uh metal to uh metal to harness contact in areas where there's movement so on the engine um transmission area uh, places where there's flex in the drivetrain where i'm not looking would be main harnesses that are like bolted to a firewall that never move so that's what I mean by vibration. Areas where a harness has movement. Um, and then areas where the harness has heat. If there's heat, um, it can deteriorate uh, plastic and, and uh, can cause all kinds of problems too. So that, that's what we look for for intermittents. Of course, doing a, a bulletin search is helpful. Uh, we got some tips from the Snap-on Troubleshooter from uh, these are known for wiring harness problems right at the connector that they'll look fine at the connector, but they pull apart inside of the insulation. It's a very odd thing to someone who's never seen that, that you can have a wire that is perfectly intact on the outside, but inside all of those copper strands are actually broken and they're not touching. And so certain times of engine flexing, your hand, uh, my hand being the wires will separate and then it'll cause your problems. And doing a visual inspection, you'd never see it. And so in that scenario, that's where you tug on the wires and you see if you can pull them apart. And if you can pull them apart, 
then it's just the insulation that's holding it together. I remember my first time seeing that and I was like, man, I can't believe what I'm looking at. It was just so odd. It was on the old GM quad four engines and they had ground wires on the front of the block for the oxygen sensor heater circuit. Or no, for the O2 sensor signal ground circuit from the computer and it did all kind of crazy stuff with the O2 and fuel trims and lose power, pulling hills and it was broken inside of the insulation. Pretty neat stuff. How can I help you? Yeah, can I get a number nine medium size with an orange Fanta? Okay. Um, also like a 10 piece chicken nugget meal, uh, medium size with a Sprite. And okay. uh, some buffalo sauce, please. And then uh, one extra cheeseburger, please. Here. Keep your straw. Stupid kids. Good. Get off of me. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna call this a fix. Um, am I 100% sure that it's fixed? No, I am not. Um, but again, we'll keep you guys posted. As far as, uh, you know, building a job like this for you guys following along, always difficult to build when you're not sure, but you gotta stand by what you know, you know, how much time you had in the car from taking the doghouse off to troubleshooting uh, to repairing that connector and um, you know as far as charging goes the key is communication with your customer throughout the process and as long as you're talking with your customer and you're letting them know where you are and that you're not hundred percent sure on the fix but these things that we did needed to be corrected um, you know the oxygen sensor has nothing to do with the throttle um, issue and the, the reduced power mode but you know communication there is important too and uh, yeah, I know many people who would have sold that oxygen sensor in this job and, and would have told the customer that it's related just to save time and conversation. And that's just bull That's not how this should be done. But I've seen it done that way many times. Um, and uh, yeah, communication's key. So I hope you guys learned something on this. But guys, thank you so much for joining us. We'll keep you posted on this car and we'll see you next time.